on. After one round of the 99 Shell Series, Mark Scaife is looking dangerous. Blistering qualifying speed. Lap record breaking race pace. At Eastern Creek, Mr. 100% had it all. Leading teammate Craig Lowndes to a crushing Mobile Commodore clean sweep. In their wake, a trail of destruction. 40 V8s fighting for crucial championship points turned into a panel beaters picnic. Right now, the bells are ringing as Aussie V8 Thunder will again shake the leafy streets of Australia's original Grand Prix City at the first running of the sensational Adelaide 500. Two days, 500 k's, a capacity field and no room for error. Adelaide's concrete lined streets are waiting to punish those who stray from the racing line. It's survival of the fittest and the smartest. So strap in tight as Network 10 welcomes you to our exclusive coverage, round two of the Shell Championship Series. They've come from everywhere, the people of Adelaide, swarming to this world-famous street circuit, the scene of a decade of Formula One Grand Prix. But they're here this time to support a unique event, a supercar success story. Hello, I'm Bill Woods, and welcome to the sensational Adelaide 500. And if you thought the people of this city were a little adventurous in giving it that name, we'll stick around for the next four hours today and four hours again tomorrow. I think you'll understand what this is all about. 41,000 people here yesterday. That is remarkable support for this event on a working day, mind you. It has been fantastic so far. And this is a sample of what you will see over the weekend. A program of events today, the top ten shootout highlights. That'll sort out the first five rows on the grid. GT production cars in action. Formula Adelaide, Sir Jack Brabham leading a parade of historic Formula One cars. And the V8 supercars, of course, the main event here, 250 kilometres, leg one of the sensational Adelaide 500, racing today for 100 Shell Championship Series points and sorting out the grid positions for the second leg of 250 kilometres tomorrow where they will race for another 200 championship points and the ultimate victory. Barry Sheen, marvellous support so far for this event. And you know a little, little, little bit about performing in Adelaide in terms of motorsport? <laughs> well, it's fantastic. The first time I ever came to Australia was 14 years ago with George Harrison to the very first F1 GP here. And we were amazed then all the Formula 1 teams were amazed at how professional it was and everything. If you look at the infrastructure here, it's exactly the same as it was for the Formula 1. And what is amazing, you know, all the, all the V8 guys are saying, oh, I can't believe they've done all this for us. You know, it's quite amazing. You go into the town, it's just like it was for the Formula 1 with the big bars, all the parts and everything and you have to hand it to Adelaide they've really made it what is it sensational no doubt about it the drivers are soaking it up one of those drivers Neil Crompton very competitive this weekend we'll have a look at top 10 qualifying in just a moment but right now he gives us a very close look at this Adelaide circuit Here's the inside line on the revised Adelaide layout. It's 50% classic street circuit and 50% purpose-built racetrack. These circuits are a lot of fun for the drivers, but they're also very busy and a real handful with lots of turns, high curbs, concrete canyons and a few bumps in places. Bottom line, there's no rest or room for error. This track is a little different to the old GP circuit. Gone are the banana bends past the market, stag corner and the long Brabham straight. The new layout is half a K shorter at 3.22 kilometres, runs clockwise and there's 13 turns. What delivers time here? Driver focus and concentration are big items. The first mission is to ignore these two tonne concrete blocks which are right by the side of the track. Sounds easy enough. Another key ingredient is to make the car strong under brakes and quick around these right angle bends. There's half a dozen or so second gear turns, so the car must turn well at slow speed where the wings don't work. And every time you open the tap with 600 horsepower, it's critical that you don't torch the rear tyres by making too much wheel spin. Passing spots? Quite reasonable really, with around eight places where a pass is theoretically possible under brakes. Remember, there's two legs to this enduro, so teamwork, strategy and efficient pit stops are mega important. And because street circuits are hard on cars, reliability is king. 
While Neil's busy on the track, of course, heading our commentary team once again this afternoon will be Mark Osler and Lee Diffie. Gentlemen, it is great to see the V8 supercar drivers here with top billing. Oh, it is, isn't it, Bill? And they deserve it. I mean, when you think about it, they go to the Australian Grand Prix and Honda Indy on the Gold Coast is second on the billing. But, in fact, a lot of people actually go to those events to see the V8. So it's very deserved. And, Mark, uh, we're all excited to be here. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, fantastic. The guys here are calling it Bathurst in a bull ring. And I'm not, uh, you, you, it's not hard to see why. This is a very brutal racetrack. There's concrete walls, big curbs, very tough on transmissions, very hard on brakes, and ultimately very hard on the drivers. This is going to be a real torture test. Torture test indeed see for yourself here are the highlights from yesterday's top 10 shootout history in the making the aussie v8s in their first adelaide 500 top 10 shootout the ford versus holden battle reaching new heights series leader craig lounge set off on a flyer chasing garth tander's early target only to encounter some unexpected traffic oh! Collects John Walker on his slowdown lap. That must have been daydreaming. I didn't even think to look at my mirror on a top 10 shootout. Boy, sorry about that, guys. I guess I've got to go a little bit close towards the end there. I, I, I take a little little different approach to this. Uh, I sort of go out there and go fast from the start. So, yeah, it's just probably a little bit misjudgment by everyone. Well, after being fastest in qualifying, Ford's Glenn Seaton let it all hang out. Seaton is pushing the MTR. It's his goal. That's it. Fuck it up that lap big time, Barry. Um, the rest of the lap was all right. It was just um, over the back there, just um, miscalculated and slipped in the dirt. But it was a case of being on the pace for reigning Bathurst champion Jason Bright, the Queenslander snaring the top spot. The time across the line. Yeah, the 125-23 for Jason Bright. Sort of struggled to set up a little bit in practice. Um, you know. We're very happy now. Um, you know, the car was very good then, so they just did a nice clean lap and you know, it did the time. The normally barnstorming Mark Scape had to settle for second best. Look, that was a really good lap, but I uh, I got a little bit out of step coming onto the back straight bars and almost uh, almost stuck it in, so um, I had to be a bit, a, bit, a, bit, a bit conservative the last bit. While for Crompton and Ingle, who finished sixth and seventh respectively, frustration set in. That was a bit of a slack effort, wasn't it? It was really, that wasn't the enforcer. Jesus, nah, that's all right. Look, uh, got Barry, it's a long race, and we've set our car up to uh, to go the distance, not for one lap. Ford may have taken first blood in this inaugural event, but with a title testing circuit and two days of racing ahead, the eventual outcome is anyone's guess. Well, he might have an old body, but he a young body, rather. He showed a very old head. I'm talking about Jason Bright, his second V8 supercar career pole position. Well done. The two Mobile One HRT cars, Scape and Lowndes, come next. And Garth Tander, the young 22-year-old, showing again when he takes it a little easier and shows a little more maturity, he can do the job brilliantly. Radisic, the quiet achiever, well positioned in five in the Shell Helix Ford. And Neil Crompton pleased with his sixth. The old EL, the FTR car, showing a lot of speed. So, unfortunately, Glenn C was the quickest qualifier, dropped from the top spot back to eighth position. Well, stay with us here on your home of Motorsport Network 10. The action only gets better right after this. Osler's with him. Over the last couple of seasons, Mark Scaife has been the king of the top 10 qualifying shootout. But in qualifying yesterday, a new challenger arose to try and unseat him from the throne. And that is Jason Bright. Fantastic effort, Jason. And you really upset the Holden fans. That was a brilliant lap. Yeah, I just concentrated on keeping it all smooth. Um, I knew if we kept it, did a nice smooth lap and, uh, you know, didn't put a wheel off the track, I knew we'd be in the top five. Um, as the lap went on, I realised this is going to be a, quite a good one. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was just a matter of, you know, keeping it all nice and smooth and not touching the curves. This is going to be a very tough weekend for all you guys. I've heard some of the drivers describe this place as violent, as brutal, a real bull ring. Is that the way it's going to be? Oh, for sure. You know, our top speed's only about 230 here, and, you know, we're just constantly going up the gears, down the gears. Um, a lot of tight corners, a lot of hard braking. You know, it's going to be very hard on the drivers. Um, you know, we, normally we've got a long distance race like Sandown or, or Bathurst where you get a bit of a break on the straights. Just, you just don't get that sort of break here. 
Now, that's obviously hard on drivers, hard on equipment, but there's also a lot of strategy here too, isn't there? Oh, for sure, yeah. You know, we've got two fuel, well, one fuel stop, one tyre stop, and, you know, where we position those stops is going to be very important. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of different strategies I think you see today, and, and maybe next year everybody will come back and, and, you know, probably have a bit better idea of what to do. Well, it should be quite a contest. We'll watch with interest. Best of luck. Thanks, Mark. A large chunk of Formula One history has been... Well, he's shown some of his potential because, you know, he hasn't driven the car hardly at all. Every circuit he's been to, apart from this one, he's never been to before. And I think you're going to see good stuff from Radisic. They're, they're just, getting the, uh, just getting the Ford sorted out now. And uh, it's, he's certainly going quick. Pictures there from the Whitman slideship. And we mentioned it earlier, but that marvellous stand that runs the length of the straight, which is uh, absolutely chock-a-block now, the crowd packing in to see this event. As you can imagine, uh, they've been milling around in various displays, but now they're going to line the track for this one. You look at that, it's just, that aerial shot was just like a shot of a European Grand Prix. You know, this is the biggest effort that anybody has ever made for touring cars in the world. You know, anywhere in Europe has never done this. And uh, judging by the support they've received this weekend with uh, a lead-in of less than 12 months, I think this will just get bigger and uh, be quite quite remarkable and uh, certainly world-renowned. In the commentary position, of course, Mark Osler with Lee Diff even up there the atmosphere must be amazing uh, it certainly is Billy it's been that way uh, ever since we arrived on Thursday and then of course yesterday to have the 41,000 strong crowd here it's just amazing it's like being in, at Bathurst but in a different state well we'll take a break now because on the other side we'll have the V8s in action seriously in the sensational Adelaide 500 Cars are just waiting for the warm-up. It's been very, very busy, and you would have seen there the garages occupied with priority by the V8s this weekend instead of playing second fiddle to the open wheelers of Formula One. Scaife leading the championship by six. Garth Tander, one of the revelations, coming through to take a top three spot after the first round and very quick again this weekend. He's with a very solid team as well that should sustain him for the 500 kilometres of this sensational Adelaide 500. Glenn Seaton, very quick too. Unseated, in fact, by Jason Bright in the top ten shootout. And Russell Ingle, of course, along with his teammate Larry Perkins, endurance specialists so watch out for them as well and welcome once again to a man who's really enjoyed the atmosphere here because he'll be patrolling pit lane this afternoon greg rust really nice to see you again and what a sensational feeling here it is on the grid at the moment i've heard this place likened this weekend to the bull ring uh, i'm right in the thick of it now one of the gladiators who's going to be doing battle is young garth tander he showed a really good strong level-headed piece of driving at the first round at eastern creek what is the approach for the first league of the adelaide 500 today Pretty much more of the same, basically. Uh, you have to finish this race to have any chance for tomorrow with a big points count. Um, we really have to survive the first couple of laps of this race before um, you let everything settle down. And then, um, yeah, just push the front and hopefully everything will stay right. A couple of tight corners in front of you and a lot of competitors behind you. Well, that's right. Hopefully everyone is aware that it's a 500k event and um, it's not a 100 metre dash to the first corner. So with a bit of luck, we'll all get through the first couple of corners. Everything will settle down to a pattern and we can all race on. Well, the guy who's in front of him right now is Mark Scaife and Barry Sheen is with him. Yeah, Mark, uh, it's going to be a long old race in front of you. It certainly is, Barry. It's one of those races where we're going to have to be very disciplined. You know, our strategy needs to be that with 20 laps to go, you've got to be in the hunt. So even if there's a bit of a bolter, I'm going to make sure that we keep our head and don't do anything silly. And what about on the car? Are you going to have to look after the brakes or just sort of what do you, any, any problems with it, you know, like brakes as an example? Look, mate, honestly, you're going to have to look after the brakes, the tyres, probably the drivetrain especially because a couple of the corners that come out of in second gear, it's very bumpy. So we'll have to watch ourselves because uh, they won't live if you do it 100% every lap. We can rely on you for a good result, though, Scapey, can't we? Oh, mate, I'll be trying, you know that. <laughs> Best of luck, Mark. Over to you, Greg. Well, the Shell Helix race team didn't have the best of luck in the first round of the championship, but the team has really gone back to the drawing board with the, uh, the handling of these cars for round two here at Adelaide. Paul Radisic, uh, the car's just so different now. Well, yeah, definitely. We made some big changes and uh, 
you know, I'm very delighted in, uh, in picking up fifth position considering we haven't, you know, we've done no running, we've just taken a good stab at a setup and it's, it's working well. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to, uh, to not only today's race but also improving the car as we go. Some of the competitors here have said that the best approach for today is to, to take things easy and concentrate on tomorrow but I know you're one who's uh, not going to play it that way. Well, mate, if there's a gap there, I'll still be going for it. I'm, I am mindful of, uh, of tomorrow, and I'll be keeping that in the back of my mind, but uh, I'm here to race, and that's what I'll do. All right, Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm with uh, Glenn Seaton. Now, you're a long way back here, Glenn. <laughs> Not too far, Barry. It's only probably about 50 yards of the front line, but uh, it's going to be a, a new, completely different game today. Like, this is the first that uh, any of us, I suppose, have done this distance in one stint. And, and um, it's, it's a circuit that takes so much concentration with all the walls around. So it's, I think it's going to spend a lot of people today. And I'm just going to try and basically um, go easy early, try and hold with the leaders, but um, and work on the race at the end because I think it's, uh, it's going to be very hard in the body. No going on the dirt like you did yesterday. <laughs> Well, I might <laughs> might have to. It might be the quicker way around. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Over to you, Greg. Well, from one Ford driver to another, from an AU driver to an EL driver, John Bow, where is that AU of yours and when are we going to see it? Well, we hope it's going to make its debut in Perth, which is uh, about three weeks away. I think we've been having a few delays with componentry, but obviously by the, uh, the way that some of the others are going, I, you know, I can't wait to get my hands on it and start to uh, develop it. Obviously, they require some development, but very good car. You've had uh, a little bit of work to do on this car since Eastern Creek, but it's looking and sounding strong uh, for the Adelaide 500. Well, it is. Uh, it was never intended that we would race this car. The AU was going to be ready for the first race, but we've had to press this one into service, so to speak. But uh, it's actually, I'm quite pleased with it. It's just not quite fast enough, unfortunately. As a man who's uh, been uh, to Adelaide for the Grand Prix many years ago and driven here many times, what's your impressions of this circuit and, uh, and just the atmosphere here? Oh, the atmosphere is fantastic. It's just a terrific place to race. Uh, the circuit's good, quite unusual, very gruelling, but the uh, the people are just so enthusiastic and so friendly. And I mean, you know, you, you couldn't help but get involved and get excited about it. Barry? Yeah, I'm with Tony Longhurst. Now, if there's anybody that is fit enough to do long races, it should be you, Tony. I hope so. I've been doing lots of work with Guy Andrews over the summer, and, uh, mate, it's just going to be unbelievable. I know the other drivers have said it, but two hours around here, we've got a couple of thousand gear changes. The car sitting here now is 37 degrees inside the cockpit, and, yeah, you put this suit on, the helmet, it's just like, uh, you know, running a marathon in, in a sauna. And what about, OK, it's taxing on your head, but physically, what part of your body does it tax the most? I think it's going to actually, you know, I'm right-handed, so uh, <laughs> the left hand doing the gear change, I reckon it's going to wear out our hand. I wouldn't be surprised if everyone ends up with blisters and knocks your arm around a lot. The speed through the corners isn't that great here, so the G-forces isn't, you know, too, too hard, but we'll, we'll be whacked by the end of the day. Yeah, I'll be having a nice cold Gatorade or something while you are doing this. I'm sure you will, Barry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Show you, Greg. Well, Dick Johnson's a little bit further back down the grid from Tony Longhurst, but how are you feeling? I'm feeling really good now, but uh, obviously when I left uh, pit lane, I felt okay. And then when I got round here, I, was, I felt as though I was busting. I've been drinking that much, so uh, I had to do the unthinkable, mate. It was the first time ever in 35 years that I've had to pee in a bottle. <laughs> so an early pit stop for Dick Johnson. <laughs> Very early, but uh, hopefully it's going to be the last one of that nature. All right, your thoughts looking ahead toward the Adelaide 500. How does Dick Johnson, a man who's a seasoned campaigner in endurance racing terms, tackle the first leg of this race today? Well, obviously, uh, you know, you've got to use a bit of common sense in an event like this and you've got to sort of calculate things. And it maybe it's not going to be the fastest guy that wins. I think it's the guy that's going to sort of uh, sit there and sort of not get himself into any trouble and hopefully I'll be able to stay out of trouble. Sometimes it's somebody else's problem and you get involved in it. But... Now, that's just the nature of the business, but I'll certainly be uh, taking it fairly easy and, uh, and making sure that I'm uh, a lot further up tomorrow. There's lots of fans here to see you. Best of luck. Thanks very much, and I'd like to thank them too. They've been absolutely magnificent. Barry? Yeah, it's going to be hard work out there today, Murph. You're not wrong, mate. She's, uh, the, the heat sort of changed a bit. It's very humid, very muggy. It's going to be uh, the fight of the toughest, that's for sure. And how come you're so far back here, Murph? It's not you. Trust me, mate, I, I was trying to be further up. It just didn't work out that way. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy with the race setup. The car, it feels really nice. It's just um, we don't seem to have as much speed as the front guys. But your class and your superior driving is going to do the trick, Murph, isn't it? 
Oh, you make me feel so good. <laughs> Best of luck. Over to you, Billy. Oh, yeah, one of the hottest drivers out there. There's no question, Greg Murphy. And uh, that team with the new VT Commodore will improve as the season goes on. Perhaps we'll see some drastic improvement this weekend. Lee Diffie and Mark Osler. Well, talking with Fred Gibson, uh, Greg Murphy's team owner, earlier this morning he said you know a lot of people are expecting a lot of us so early you know the, the facts are that they're two brand new cars and they haven't done any testing in between the race meetings and they're starting from scratch so everywhere they go every different track so whether it's albert park or eastern creek or here in adelaide they're starting from scratch each time because they have no data on the car and they're starting from scratch of course they raced the vs's last year with Peyton Hossack, so uh, maybe we should cut the wins, boys, a little bit of slack, but uh, in an endurance race, anything can happen. I think the struggles that uh, Gibson are having in getting these cars competitive are just an indication of how competitive V8 supercar racing is at the moment. I mean, look at a lot of the qualifying efforts, 12, 15 cars covered by less than a second. I mean, that's not even a blink. If you just make one little error in a gear change, you maybe just don't get one corner exactly right. You've gone from second on the grid to 10. It's a tough, tough act. It's Formula Ford style, isn't it? Let's have a look at the Shell Helix grid. This is the way they line up for the sensational Adelaide 500. The 25-year-old Jason Fry, his second career pole ahead of Mark Scape. Lowndes and Tander, they share the second row. Row three, Paul Radisich, great to see the Shell Ford up there ahead of Neil Crompton. Russell England, Glenn Seat, row four. Out of five, Mark Larkham in the Mitre 10 Ford with John Faulkner alongside the Commodore. John Bow and Tony Longhurst, two Fords out of row six. Wayne Gardner and Larry Perkins out of seven. And Jason Bargwana and Greg Murphy out of eight. Winded back to row nine, Dick Johnson alongside Thomas Mazira, Mark Noski and Cameron McLean, best privateer in 20th position. Stephen Richards, Trevor Ashby, Dougal McDougal and Mick Donoher. John Briggs and Chris Smurton out of 13, 14, Peter Dulman and Rodney Forbes, top privateer, Simon Emazidis and Danny Osborne. Out of 15, out of 16, David Parsons and Karen Brewer. Back to Rod Nash, Mike Imry, row 17, row 18 is Mike Conway, Barry Morgan, Darcy Russell and Alan Heath returns to the V8s from row 19. And Daniel Miller, a newcomer, a youngster, right at the back of the pack as the cars head off, all 40 of them on their warm-up lap. Yeah, great shot there of Mark Scape weaving backwards and forwards behind our pole man. Let's go have a look through some of these cameras. He'll be riding with us throughout the weekend. Out the back of Jason Wright's per Tech Falcon and the Mobile One Commodore of Mark Skate. There's going to be a great battle between those two. Glenn Seaton, you're on board with the Ford Livet camera. The man who was fastest here on Friday got knocked off in the top 10 shootout later on in the day. But it's going to be, there's another angle looking over the shoulder of Glenn Seaton and the new works backed Ford Tickford Racing Falcon AUXR8. His teammate Neil Crompton fared better in qualifying after Glenn made that mistake. They've got a great shot there from the dashboard of the Enforcer, Russell Engel. Chromium helmet looking every bit the champion that he is and looking to win this one in front of his home crowd. This is the view down Adelaide Strait as we climb on board the Mitre 10 AU XR8 with Mark Larkham. We know this guy can do the Enduros well from the FAI 1000 Classic at Bathurst. We've got a footbox camera. This will be interesting to watch because there are something like 21 gear changes per lap, which works out to be 1,638 gear changes for this afternoon's race. These guys are going to be working overtime, Barry. They really are. I'm just looking at Mark's foot there. Um, basically, what he's doing is just getting some warmth in the brakes and that, just making sure everything works. And, uh, you know, the last thing you want is a nice spongy brake, pad, uh, brake pedal the first lap into the... Uh, into the chicane or the the core at the end of the long straight it's uh it's going to be survival of the fittest this is lee you know it's somebody that really uses their head you ain't going to win this in the first 20 laps or 30 or 40 laps but, you know you've really got to look after it as we said at the beginning of the telecast survival of the fittest and the smartest the gatorade on board camera peter dulman who one of our uh, privateer campaigners will be working very hard this afternoon Everybody's going to be the first, uh, you can remember with the Grand Prix here, the uh, the first uh, chicane after the start and finish line on the first lap, you know, everybody really needs to, do, because it's not a, a 10 lap, 12 lap sort of Grand Prix race anymore, you know, or the supposed race of the Grand Prix, everybody really needs to take it nice and easy to get through there, you know, take the first 10 or 15 laps to sort themselves out. Just having a look at some of the enormous number of onboard cameras we've got here right there with Dick Johnson a few moments ago. 
They've got it covered from every angle. The Bridgestone race analysis tells the story on the Adelaide Street circuit. 40 starters in all, a massive grid. Race distance uh, split into two 250-kilometre legs. 78 laps today, 78 laps tomorrow. We'll complete the 156-lap total. Fastest qualifier, Jason Ryder, 125.23 in the top 10 shootout yesterday. And the pit rules are you must make two stops, one for fuel and one for tyres. And you can't do both at either. Now, some news, some late mail from the pits. Daniel Miller, the young newcomer we were just speaking about, has uh, suffered a broken piston and is out for the whole event. So, hard luck for the young uh, local driver. Tough work for him. There is Larry Perkins. Didn't qualify all that well, but uh, we all know all too well how great his cars go in the endurance event. Now, of course, remember the important thing, the most important thing, is this is a full race in two parts we are getting ready to go for the sensational adelaide 500 these are the gods of thunder on the streets of adelaide set to tear it up for 250 kilometers here on your home of motorsport network 10 will bright take the early lead or will it be mark scaife the shell series points leader will keeping he take the early command keeping him a long time there lee there's a great shot. Look at the crowd. The grandstands are packed. The grid is packed. We are ready to go. The revs lift. Get set for the green light. This is the first time for the Adelaide 500. Away we go. Scape gets away to a ripper of a start. On the inside is the Pertec Ford of Jason Bright. And Bright will hit the centre chicane for the first time. Watch him scramble through here because this is very tight. Let's hope they get through. Fire Crompton skirts across the ripple strip. So too McLean and Donahue. They're still not through there yet. That's a very narrow little canyon there, but the field sorts themselves out. Fortunately, looks like a pretty clean start to the first. Sensational Adelaide 500. A massive field of V8s weave their way through the section, up to Flinders Street, down toward Hunt Street for the first time. And look who's in fourth position, Mark Radisic. We've been speaking about him the whole weekend. He's flying, Paul Radisic. And you really keep your eye on him because he's experienced in the long distance race. Tanders drop back to fifth, but it is... Early days yet. The first lap of 78 this afternoon, 78 tomorrow, making up that 500 kilometres. Down the Adelaide Strait, through the sharp kick, down onto the short and Brabham Strait. Look at the Look field. Look at the inside. Look at Russell oh, Ingle. Russell. Oh, no, Neil Crompton. No, Neil. Dear, oh, dear. Larkham's got suffered. Oh, oh no. no. There's Gardner there. Oh, oh no Thomas ski. Can they get through without any damage? Oh, there's speak. somebody else there you can hear. Neil Crompton turning oh, it around under young. brakes. And all oh, hell broke loose there. Looks like the privateers have been able to pick their way through, but that's put Crompton right to the back of the field. And, and Wayne Gardner, Gardner still Gardner. hasn't got going. Well, he started from 13th position, Gardner, and did, took some evasive action. And oh, he's look got at some that. damage to the rear of his car. Hopefully that won't affect the tyre. And if it doesn't, that'll be good news for him because he will be able to continue. We're on to lap two. The first one down of 78 is gone. A little bit of action on the opening map. Neil Crompton, whether he locked the brakes coming into the Brabham hairpin there or not. And nonetheless, it is the Pertec Ford of Jason Wright who leads the way. It did look a bit like the rear, rear brakes locked up on the car because the thing was well out of shape, you know, coming from the rear. Out of Hutt Street corner onto Adelaide Street. Down the back. Let's right have a look at that again on the Shell Helix replay. Yeah, it's rear Crompton. brakes. Yep. Rear brakes. Like, too much bias on the rear and it just locked them up. And once it does, that tucks the back end out. You've had it. But the miracle is that nobody whacked anybody here. Yeah. You know, it's, you've it's got to hand it to them. It's amazing, isn't it, when yeah, these cars are running incredible. a full tank of fuel. They've got the fuel tank in the back over the rear wheels. The teams like to run as much rearward brake bias as they can to try and save the front exactly, brakes. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, Mark. Yeah. Because with more bias on the back and the more weight on the back, you can stop the thing quicker. But just as you saw there in the yeah. shot, it's, it's very easy to get caught yeah. out, isn't it? Absolutely. And Crompton's been bitten hard. That's putting him right to the back of the field. He's got a lot of work to do to chase down this man. Jason Bright, the reigning Bathurst champion in the Pertec Falcon, leads oh, the Mobile Honda right, Racing Team Duo. Cars. And Paul Radisic starting to really apply the flame torch to the back of the Holden Racing Team Duo. It is the Pertec Ford from the two Mobile One HRT Commodores, and here comes the Shell Helix Ford. Two times World Touring Car Cup champ Paul Radisic. He's finally got the package that he wants. Things are going well for the Shell Helix Ford. Will this be the first time we see him in the Shell Championship Series do what we all know that he can?
Well, he's been a tremendous boost to the driver lineup there, a tremendously experienced ki driver, the Kiwi. Two times FIA World Cup champion, a very fast driver in the British Touring Car Championship. He's a guy with a lot of experience of testing and chassis development, and he really has brought a lot of that class to the Shell team. Look at the speed of the Shell Ford as he hunts down the Holden Racing Team Commodores. Yeah, I spoke to Paul this morning, and he was saying that finally they got the balance sorted out on the car. You know, it was either you'd sort the back end out and then the front would give trouble, but it's balanced perfectly now. And um, so when you make any adjustments to it, dampers or brakes or whatever, you know, the, whatever result you want, so you should get, actually happens. And before they were just going nowhere, but now they've got it sus. Russell Engel has come all the way up into fifth position behind Radisic. There's your race score, the Shell Helix race score. And behind him, it looks like Garth Tander. So good to see young Garth just taking it easy. He's not rushing things. In behind him, the AUXR8, the FTR car of Glenn Seaton. Fifth gear, flying around. They go all the way back to second before the run onto the main straight here in Adelaide. The view from the rear of Mark Scaife's car. Down they come. 127.81 for Jason Bright as he crosses the start finish line. About two seconds off their ultimate qualifying pace. More than two seconds, actually, but they're running their full tank of fuel, 120 litres of shell unleaded in the back of each one of these cars. And they're just bedding everything in nicely. They've got a long haul in front of them. It's very easy to get caught up in all the adrenaline of these opening laps. But a lot of these drivers, very experienced under these conditions, and they'll know that there's a long way to go. You see the way that Jason Bright has come on now. He really has matured, hasn't he? I blamed him for the accident with him and Perkins at Eastern Creek. And when we got it... And then we got the other shot of it, and you can clearly see that it was Larry. So uh, sorry about that, Jason, but he's really matured. Garth Tander tried to take advantage of that slow exit onto the back straight by Russell Lingley when he ran right off, really off where uh, Glenn Seaton went yesterday. But the Castrol driver managed to recover. And you can see him covering his territory. Garth Tander now looking for a way past the Silver Commodore. It seems like there's a lot of concrete dust or something when they get over the other side of that curve. I don't know what they put down there. Up the top end of the circuit, this is the run around the back of the paddock and pit area. Here's a replay of the incident where Russell Ingle ran wide, coming on oh, to the boy, Adelaide yeah. straight. Exactly where Glenn Seaton ran off during the top ten yesterday. Garth Tander tucking in behind, then Seaton. There's John Bauer who's made his way up. Oh, oh God! God. Wayne Gardner and John Briggs. Well, boy, you could say that Gardner doesn't exactly get a fair share of luck. Can't you? Oh, he has had a shocker. He got caught up in that uh, first spin at the hairpin at the bottom of the straight. Now he's collected or been involved in a collision with John Briggs. That is that. That looks like it's at the top of the Adelaide straight. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they have the uh, safety car out all day. Oh, there. he's not a happy oh. chappy. Oh, he wants to rip into John Briggs too. <laughs> Wayne Gardner, you can never accuse him of not showing his emotions on his sleeve. He just wanted to tear strips off bricks. Well, there must have been an altercation there, and Gardner is not impressed. He uh, had a tough time at the Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne, where he had an altercation where Garth Tander hit him from behind, and he went straight into the wall. We've got a full course yellow. The safety car will be out, and Wayne Gardner is absolutely disgusted. Yeah, well that was uh, coming out of Hutt Street onto the back straight for the first time. Cars will now be under yellow flag conditions. That means it's a full caution for the circuit. No overtaking allowed. They'll just sit in single file until they get these wrecks cleared up. And there's Gardner talking to John Briggs. Arms up in the air. What the hell was that all about? Briggs is trying to explain. I think Briggs, he better leave it. <laughs> I have to say that. I don't think approaching Wayne at this stage is going to be advisable. Well, that wasn't the start. Gardner's only doing a few events this year and uh, was looking for a big one at Adelaide. Consistent run over the two days. First half today, second half tomorrow. And that is not the way he wanted to start. But the good thing is that he can get the car repaired and take the grid tomorrow for the final 78 laps. Hopefully get a big result for the Coca-Cola team. Safety car out, and uh, I guess you can say this has come out a little earlier than what the Stone brothers would have liked. Speaking with Jimmy Stone earlier, he said, what we're hoping for, we won't start with a completely full tank. And 
and he said uh, we're hoping for a pace car around about lap 24. We'll fill her up and that'll get us home. Long way to go yet though. Bright leads away from Scape and Lowndes. We're just settling into this one. Radisic has got the early jump. He's up there into fourth ahead of Ingle. Tanda, Seaton and John Bow in the cat board. Tony Longhurst in ninth. Larkham in the Mitre 10 forward in 10th. Greg Murphy is up 11th. Dick Johnson, Larry Perkins, John Faulkner, Jason Bargwana and Mark Noski, the Holton Young line. We go back to Dougal McDougal, Stevie Richards, Cameron McLean, all the way back to Thomas Mazira, 24, four of the 500 right after this. The safety car is out. We're under yellow as the sensational Adelaide 500 lives up to its name. Mark Osley, you called this thing the bull ring. Well, Wayne Gardner, no bull, was on a charge and came unstuck. Yeah, very disappointed. The 1987 World 500cc champion. As I said, he's only doing a few of the boutique events this year, meaning the race here, Bathurst, Queensland 500, and looking for a big result in the Coca-Cola Commodore. And I know Greg Rust, his team, are looking forward to a big result here too. Mark, but uh, some very disappointed faces down here at the moment, and one of them is uh, Belinda Clappen, who looks after the team for Wayne. And uh, have you spoken to him yet, Belinda? No, we actually haven't had a chance to speak with him yet. Obviously, he looks extremely disappointed, and I don't blame him. At the moment, they're bringing the car back; it's on the tow truck, so we should be able to assess the damage fairly shortly. Hopefully, he'll be with the tow truck. Now, I understand you've spoken to uh, the officials from CAMS as well. Depending upon how much damage the car has, you may be back uh, for the start tomorrow. That's right. If it's repairable, we'll definitely be back for the start tomorrow. We've Obviously got a lot riding on this as well and we're exposure from major sponsors of Coca-Cola. So we'll be really working as hard as we can in order to get the car back for tomorrow. That's a real shame. We'll let you get back to it. No, thank you very much. Well, let's hope that everything goes a great deal better than what it has so far for Wayne Gardner outfit. You can see Wayne just assessing the damage. He's not pleased and uh, you can totally understand why. You see, we had shots earlier of John Briggs, who he was involved with in the accident, trying to explain the situation. As the rest of the field keep cruising around, a fair bit of damage to the front of uh, Larry Perkins' car too, so obviously he's nudged someone from behind, but uh, not substantial enough to stop him from continuing. There's your Shell Helix race score, Bright Scaife, Lowndes, Radisic doing well, Ingle, Tander, Seaton and Bow, who's coming up very quietly, Longhurst, Larkham, Murphy, He's done extremely well ahead of Dick Johnson. Perkins has dropped a little. Faulkner, Barguana has dropped back. When you think about it, Gardner still has an opportunity to star tomorrow because under these rules, 100 points awarded for the first leg today, the first 78 laps, 200 points available for the second leg tomorrow. With the car repaired overnight, Gardner can take his position on the grid. And as far as the, con the conditions of this race are concerned, he hasn't dropped any laps. So we'll have a, he'll have a crack at victory tomorrow in the second half. The trouble is, though, Mark, it really did, really did look like it was badly damaged, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, only the mechanics will know when we get it back. Well, let's go to inside. The, the minor 10 forward, Mark Larkham. Hi, it's Lee Diffie. Can you hear us, Mark? Uh, hello, Mark. It's Lee Diffie in the commentary here. Can you hear us? Yeah, got you, Diff. It's a bit frantic out there, mate. Yeah, it is, mate. Um, looks like uh, Wayne, if I can fix his car, he'll be on a uh, nice set of fresh tyres for tomorrow anyway. You got through uh, You got through the Crompton incident when he spun and Gardner spun around. You got through there OK? Yeah, got through all right. Lost a couple of positions when uh, Cromley spun around, but uh, uh, we're away, mate, and uh, all in one piece. So now the trick's going to be uh, keeping the head down and uh, no mistakes and, uh, you know, be there at the end. Well, what's your strategy from here on in? Just uh, hang in there with the leaders. You want to push hard. What's your strategy? Yeah, we obviously want to stay with this uh, with this bunch. There's probably about 15 cars we've identified. We need to stay with that whole bunch. And uh, you know, I think it's going to be pretty hard uh, if you fall back below the mid group of the field to get back through because there's so many strong runners here. I mean, the guys in sort of 15th to 25th are all quick around here, and overtaking is very, very difficult. So. Uh, we want to stay up here, yeah. Mark, it's, Mark, it's Barry. Did you start with a full tank of uh, fuel, or, or like Jason, did you start with less than the full tank? No, we've actually got uh, we've got quite a bit of fuel on Barry. Oh, we, right. uh, we're running two different strategies, so um, and, and obviously uh, one of the things we don't want to end up in the pits at the same time. No, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I've got a bit of fuel on board actually. How is the car under those heavy circumstances? Well, I've got to say it's uh, surprisingly good. We ran uh, heavy fuel load in the warm up this morning. And um, 
really found the car quite balanced. So uh, we seem to be able to stick with this group travelling around at the moment. So uh, that, that, that's probably that's a good sign. The big talk, Mark, is that it's going to be really tough in terms of fitness. How's your fitness? Have you been training well? You know me, mate. I'm out on that Yamaha motocross bike uh, <laughs> every weekend and the guys aren't happy about it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the fun. I'm talking about your training. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, uh, I've had a fairly hectic uh, training schedule. It's, uh, I mean, I don't think there would be any one of these guys around me that hasn't taken it very seriously the last couple of months. You're fooling yourself uh, if you don't. I mean, I think we're going to see that really show up by sort of halfway through the race tomorrow afternoon. Mark, it's Mark Ozer. Just a final question. It must be very hard for you guys to resist getting caught up in all this cut and thrust in the opening laps. There's such a long way to go, isn't there? I've got to say, Mark, just for the record, that first corner was the best first corner I've been involved in in uh, VA Supercar racing. Yeah. It was so obvious. Everyone was conscious. They wanted to get through there without a drama. Yeah. Mark, thanks very much for your time. Best of luck for the rest of this first leg. Thanks, mate. All right, there you have it. Mark Larkham in the Mitre 10 Ford. Just uh, taking some time out to talk with us as he is uh, focusing hard and getting ready to go. And we're getting ready to go on Network 10 for round two of this year's World Superbike Championship. The next round is next Sunday, the 18th of April, and it comes to us from Phillip Island. It should be a ripper. Don't forget, too, the same weekend, the beginning of this year's World Motorcycle Championship from Malaysia. You can catch all the action on your home of Motorsport Network 10. The Superbike's three to five. The 500s right after the news at 5.30. We'll be back at Adelaide right after this break. Close to a restart here in sensational Adelaide 500. Not long after it began, we had a yellow flag. Jason Bright leading from Scape, Lowndes, Radisic, Ingle, Tanda, Seaton, Bow, Longhurst and Mark Larkham. Wayne Gardner back in the pits and angry. Well, the word through from race control is that the safety car will be exiting the circuit. After this lap, the car's weaving around. Peter Dillman in the Gatorade Commodore, just one of those. He is back in 28th position at the moment. Taking the wheel from longtime driving partner John Cotter. They'll be sharing the duties this year. You can see Neil Crompton's. Ford Tickford Racing EL Falcon just ahead as he climbs his way back through the field after that early spin. There's the pace car, the lights are out and it exits the system. We'll be back under green. The Pertec Ford of Jason Bright brings them onto the main straight. Do we see green this time around? There was a yellow as they entered the main straight, but it appears we're back under race conditions. Yes, we are. Through the centre chicane, the same order. Ingle goes through, tear to seat. So a nice clean restart, the first of what I think will be many around here. This is going to be quite a battle, but Jason Bright now has the two Holden Racing Team Commodores. Mark Scaife right behind him in car two, our reigning champion Craig Lowndes in car one, with Paul Radisic in the first of the Shell Fords in fourth, and the Silver Bullet, Russell Engel, the enforcer, up in the top five. The last time Jason Bright drove here on the streets of Adelaide, it was back in 1995 when he took out race one of the Formula Fords. It's a little different situation this time round as he leads a pack of roaring V8s in the Pertec Ford. Drove brilliantly yesterday during the top 10 shootout with such a steady head, demonstrated such composure and was just so cool. There we go back. The order remains the same. Bradisic is looking dangerous there in fourth spot. I think Ingle's looking pretty dangerous too. Running in. I don't know what strategy that team's running. But he's been the fastest man on the track so far. 127.23 before they brought out the yellow flags for the Gardner Briggs incident. So keep an eye on the enforcer as this race starts to unfold. Right behind him, the AU Falcon XR8 of Glenn Seaton, the factory Ford, was the fastest man here after provisional qualifying on Friday. Got knocked off after a terrible lap in the top 10 shootout. But Seaton has a lot of speed on board that Ford. Well, you heard Mark Scaife say earlier in, 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 in an interview with Barry Sheen, we're going to have to demonstrate a lot of discipline here this weekend in leg one today, leg two tomorrow of the entire 500 kilometres, 156 laps. He said if there's a bolter, I don't care, I'll let him go. We've just got to keep it all together. Try not to lock up the brakes. Try not to damage the tyres. Try and conserve the brakes. Try and conserve the drivetrains and conserve ourselves. Breaking hard off Hutt Street as they swing onto Adelaide Strait. Punching the car up, shifting up through the gears as they hammer down here, the fastest part of the circuit, reaching speeds. About 225 kilometres an hour on the approach to the very tight right-hand chicane. Hang on, hammering the gearbox back, back, 
as they shift a couple of gears and they're back on the throttle again as they head down Brabham Strait toward the hairpin. And I guess with a pretty angry or disappointed Wayne Gardner is our own Barry Sheen. Yeah, very disappointed Wayne Gardner. Now, Wayne, we saw nothing apart from the aftermath. What happened? On the first lap, I uh, went down to the hairpin over there and um, Larry ran up my backside and turned me around and I don't know what that was about. Uh, obviously I sat there and waited for all the traffic to go and um, then started at the back of the grid and started catching my way through the field. And then this Briggs bloke and a Falcon decides, spun out around the back there and decides to do some donuts and sitting on the middle, still doing donuts as I come around the corner and I crashed into him. Nowhere to go and I don't know what he was thinking when he was trying to do that but, you know, it was just idiotic driving and I have no idea about it. And that's just put me out now, so I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed. Well, there's a chance you can get back, if the, if the damage isn't too bad, you can get back in tomorrow. Yeah, I hope so, but, um, you know, it's pretty hard to take all these hits on the chin and... Uh, Pretty disappointing, so it sort of gets a, gets a bit hard to try and you know, get your packet back up and have another go. But look, we'll do our best, and but uh, it's certainly disheartening. Best of luck, anyway. thanks. Over to you, Greg. Well, Barry, I'm with John Briggs, the other party in that accident with Wayne Gardner. And uh, John, I can tell you, Wayne's pretty disappointed with what's happened. Uh, what, what's your side of the story? Tell us how it happened. I got turned around. I'm not sure who turned me around yet. We're in the process of finding out. I was sitting in the blind corner. Waited for most of the cars to come through, waited for the double yellows to come out. They were slowing all the cars right down, the double yellows were waving. Thought everyone was aware there was a car obviously blocking the circuit. Tried to turn around and get out of the way, I was right in the middle of the turn. And uh, Wayne came around and uh, just hit me in the centre. Well, your car is now getting off the back of the transporter and uh, it's got a bit of damage. Yeah, pretty disappointing. I'm not sure whether we can fix it for, uh, for tomorrow, but we're going to try. Lee? Yeah, some pretty busy crews tonight, won't there be? Those two are the first in the queue. Will there be any more? Let's hope not. We want a good, clean race so we can have everybody in leg two tomorrow to really take this fight right to the end of the last kilometre of this 500-kilometre classic. Now, we've just got word through that Garth Tander, Thomas Mazira, and also car three, Trevor Ashby, have been black flagged for allegedly passing under the yellow. So not good news for Tander when he's running so strong. No, the tragedy of that will unfold as they uh, bring them in for their uh, stop-go penalty. But the fastest man on the track at the moment is Mark Scaife for 127.11. He's just brought that quickest time of Ingalls down by a couple of tenths, so the car's getting quicker as this race unfolds. 14 laps completed. Jason Bright still leading, 1.3 seconds the lead over Scaife. His teammate Lowndes right behind him in third position. Radisic, Ingle, Tander, Seaton in seventh. John Bow, fantastic run in the Caterpillar Falcon. He's up in the top ten. Tony Longhurst and Mark Larkham in the Mitre 10 Ford that's on screen now. He actually rounds out the top ten. Well, I can tell you who's doing well is the guy who's right behind Mark Larkham in the Mitre 10 Ford. That is Greg Murphy in the Wins Commodore, the VT, out of the Gibson Motorsport Garage. He's worked his way from 16th into 11th at the moment. Steady but sure, that's the way Fred Gibson and team manager Alan Heafy want to run it as we have a look at some triple emetry on board Mark Larkham's car. Up into 6th, he'd be one of the few who go up into 6th on that part of the circuit. Back to 2nd. Let's have a listen to the minor 10 forward as it roars down the main straight of Adelaide. straight as we have a look at Larkham's feet at work. Yeah, this is a really great shot. 
really wonderful insight into what's going on in the foot box of these cars. Keep in mind, that's a very, very hot part of the car. They've got the exhaust running right under the floor. That's why there's that flame retardant, the heat-resistant material under his feet there. But even with that there, these drivers' feet really cook. And you can see there, braking, matching the engine revs to the car's road speed so he doesn't lock a wheel as he shifts down. Wonderful synergy, symmetry in motion there. Really ballet dancing as he pedals his way around this track. A lot of work, very physical track for the drivers. Somewhere in between 41 and 45% of the time, they spend at full acceleration. We'll talk more about that later on, but at the moment, Barry's with Gary Rogers. Yeah, I'm with Gary Rogers. Gary, what's happened? Uh, uh, cars been um, black flags, or going to be black flags. Well, Barry, according to the officials, and I haven't seen it, they say that Garth passed a car under the yellow flag during the pace car period. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the pace car period, the race is on hold, and even if he did do it, it's therefore not an offence. Well, you can see Ray Roberts in the background, one of the officials, they're sorting it all out now. This is good for the event. You hear it right there, if he goes past three times, they're going to exclude him from the event. So problems for the Gary Rogers Motorsport team and Garth Tander. Yeah, big disappointment for the youngster after that great showing, not only at Eastern Creek, but in qualifying here. But he has developed quite a cool head in a very short period of time. But now they're saying he's passing under the yellows. Black flag. That's Thomas Mazira. Out for car 32 as well. Thomas Mazira and 34. That's our man Tanda. So they're still showing the black flag. Could there be a drama ahead for the young West Australian driver if he doesn't come in? be a real shame wouldn't it after going so well at Eastern Creek well they're getting toward that uh, fuel mileage window they need to do about 25 26 laps at least before they come in for a fuel stop I reckon now uh, these cars are gonna get something like 50 51 52 laps from a tank of gas it's only one fuel stop required but I'm sure there's a lot of teams with a lot of different ideas on the best way to do this here comes Trevor Ashby, Trevor Ashby from the PPG car. He goes in and out for his stop-go penalty. Thomas Mazira is next in line. You can see them holding out the black flag for car 32. Thomas stops and drives out. Now there's one more to come. The Valvoline Commodore, Bass. Well, the point about it is they've, uh, Gary's spoken to Garth Tanner, and Garth is absolutely adamant that he didn't pass anybody under a yellow flag. So it's a bit of a predicament, you know, for, for Garth Tanner to be in, because if you know you haven't passed anybody under a yellow flag, then you think, well, OK, I'll come in now, I'll destroy my, my chance yeah. in the race. And, you know, you're in a predicament. You think, well, I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. Yeah. Paul Radisic chasing after Craig Lowndes coming through now here's Tanda will he pull in yes he does so he's doing the right thing and well if he is correct and if he is telling his team owner the truth that he didn't pass anybody under the yellow I believe there the allegation is that he passed Glenn Seaton under the yellow because in fact uh, we were talking off air we were uh, thought that he was actually in front of Seaton when the safety car came out so if he is that's going to be a hard pill to swallow for Garth Tanda but nonetheless he'll charge on hard and he comes in two cars behind his teammate Jason Bargwana and in the middle is the Holland Young Lions entry of Mark Noski. Yeah that really hurts that sort of thing that's put him back to 17th or 18th on the in the order. He's running well up in the top 10 before so he's got a lot of work to do to get back to that position but this is a long long way to go We've got fuel stops, we've got tyre stops, we've got all sorts of drama to unfold. So Tanda, very important now to keep a cool head, just get the speed back in the car and just continue to circulate. Karen Brewer on the Shell Helix replay, in trouble in the Commodore. Oh, is she going to hit that concrete wall? It just keeps No, going. thank goodness for that. This is a very punishing place. There's no runoff area around here. So Garth Tanda, after serving his sentence, is back in the action. Look at this gaggle of cars here. Well, Larkham trying to get past Tony Longhurst and you'd assume that maybe he's being held up there because there's a big chain. Larkham, then we go back to Greg Murphy, Dick Johnson, Larry Perkins in behind them. And then it looks like John Faulkner. Well, it's the battle for ninth position, I guess you could say. There's four of them squabbling over it. Longhurst in ninth. In the Castrol XR8 Falcon. Then you've got another XR8 in the Mitre 10 colour scheme. Wins Commodore. So great battles up and down through the pack as we go on board in the Mitre 10 Ford with Mark Larkham 
taking a very conservative approach as he said in our cross earlier on he says he's carrying a lot of fuel so maybe they're going to stretch it and do his fuel stop late in the race we shall find out a lot of fascinating pit strategies and scenarios to unfold here well yeah and then you uh, you actually heard mark larkham say we're running a totally different strategy to jason bright there's your minor 10 lap counter lap 20 of 78 we're churning through them fairly quick these two cars, of course, I'm talking about the Pertec Ford, the Mitre 10 Ford. They both come under the same umbrella, umbrella of Stone Brothers Racing, but are autonomous to a certain degree under that umbrella. Ross and Jimmy Stone work on Bright's car exclusively, and Mark Larkham has his own team of engineers and mechanics as they whip through this quick part of the circuit now. Down the short and grab them straight. Let's have a look at your Shell Helix race score. Bright, Scaife, Lowndes, Radisich maintaining that fourth. So too, Russell Ingalls, Seaton steady in sixth. Mao and Longhurst. Yeah, it's tight at the top. 17 seconds behind our race leader, Mark Larkham, Greg Murphy, Dick Johnson, Larry Perkins, John Faulkner, Jason Bargwana, Mark Noski, and Garth Tander right back there in 16th after that stop go. The second wins Commodore of Stephen Richards in 17. McDonough in 22nd. More right after this. The wonderful Whitman's Lightship there showing the beauty of the tree-lined Adelaide street circuit where there's been plenty of action already on this 2 by 250 kilometer weekend of V8 supercar racing. And Perkins in peril. Here's the catchphrase down in pit lane where Larry is suffering from an earlier clash with Wayne Gardner. In fact, the first of two that has uh, eventually led to Wayne's retirement from the race. Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm standing here. The problem with Larry's car is you saw where they took uh, the bumper off of the front of it. You can see there where all the metal is um, sort of crunched up on the front. Um, it's basically damaged the radiator, I think, because uh, the thing's boiling. So although it wasn't getting a proper airflow through it, I think it's more uh, more damaged than anything else because there's water leaking out from underneath it. It's it's been in the pits now for uh, getting off for three minutes, so uh, plus the fact they've got to cool the thing down and get some water back in it. Well, three cars that are in the pits, and two of them come from the Perkins garage. Larry himself, and of course Wayne Gardner's Coca-Cola Commodore was built and is prepared by Perkins Engineering, so not a happy day for those guys to start with. Meanwhile, the Pertec Ford, how strong does it look? The AU XR8 of Jason Bright is still surging on as he comes up on Paul Romano and Rod Nash. Still the Mobile One HRT Commodores in behind. Yeah, they're a fabulous looking race car, the new Fords, aren't they? Very aggressive aerodynamics package, the distinctive four headlight front. And I've got to say, Ross and Jim Stone who screw these cars together up on the Gold Coast, just beautifully built machinery. Really uh, quite amazing effect on the dashboard, all built out of carbon fibre. It actually brings the instruments you know, closer to the driver. Look where the driver's sitting in the car. Well, he'd certainly know about this, though, with Mark Scaife right up behind the Pertec Ford. He's sick of sitting in behind there. He's going to have a real go at the lead. So all of a sudden, Holden Racing Team, sick of sitting in behind the Falcon. They want a taste of the lead. Climbs out of the corners pretty well, though. Plenty of speed on the Pertec Ford. They're coming up on some slower traffic now. They came through on Rod Nash, and that caused a little bit of a slowdown point for Bright. Look at this. They weave in and out of the traffic past Karen Brewer. Coming up on Paul Romano. Scapers right alongside. They head around, and this is a second gear section of the track. They do not get out of second gear here. Just quick blast between these. This snaking section, the top section of the Adelaide circuit through out of Wakefield Street into East Terrace, Flinders Street, and out of Hutt Street. Right now, onto the big straight, Adelaide straight as Radisich rides the rear of Craig Lowndes. Radisich going with him. Look at that. Star formation there as they hunt down this leading Pertec Falcon up toward the chicane. Bang back through a couple of gears. Headlights ablaze for Mark Scaife as they pick their way through the trap. And it looks like Russell Ingle really is closing the gap. Look how wide Paul Radisich goes as he tries to hunt down the second of the Holden Racing Team cars. Well, anybody was questioning the Kiwi coming into the V8 Supercar Series. He's running with the best of them right now. Showing them what the Shell Helix Ford can do. Well, for any of those teams planning to take on a full tank of fuel, they're sort of in that stop window now 25 laps completed so we could have a rash of pit stops from now on mark scape windscreen wiper on for the pertec falcon mark scape flames belching from the exhaust of the mobile one commodore perkins is still in the pits oh, look at this big gap what massive gap from bright back to scape 
head through the centre chicane one more time. Scape Lowndes as they jump the ripple strips and Russell Ingle has remained steady in that fifth spot, trying to stay with Paul Radisich. I was going to say before, looking at those uh, stone-built Fords, look at the driving position of Jason Bright. If anyone drives a, a modern Falcon, they'll see that he's sitting in a very different position right back. His head's almost behind the B-pillar when you look at the car in side view. Extreme rearward seating position, the idea being that with that big lump of cast iron V8 over the front axle, really try and spread the weight around, get more weight as they can off the front end. And you look at both those cars, both Mark Larkham and Jason Bright sit very far back in the saddle. There's your Shell Helix race score, and if we get another caution period soon, you are going to see a flurry in the pits because they'll all be coming in left, right and centre for a fuel top-up. That's if they're on the similar strategy to the Pertec Ford of Jason Bright. Flames belching from the Mobile One HRT Commodores. We're very privileged to be joined now in the commentary box by Repsol Honda team manager, Mick Doohan's team manager, set for another season, set to uh, guide Mick to perhaps his sixth World 500cc championship, Jeremy Burgess. JB, welcome. Thank you very much, Lee. It's great to be here. Well, you're an Adelaide boy. What do you think about the uh, the V8s on the streets? Absolutely fantastic. It's it's a great thing to see, and it's very good to see the Fords competitive with the Holdens. Now let's talk a little bit about the bikes just quickly. Uh, Mick's all set to go. You're feeling confident again to make it six in a row? Well, we're never really confident, Lee, but we've got the team and we've got the rider. We know that, and we, hopefully the bike will be up to speed. As an Adelaide resident, you, uh, you're happy to see the racing return to the streets? My word, I think it's a great thing for Adelaide, and as you can see by the people, everybody's got behind it, and I think they'll continue to do so. Well, they bunch up again. Scaife is right back with Bright now. Not quite sure what caused that massive gap earlier, but this tight five of Bright, Scaife, Lowndes, Radisich and Ingle. They're a cut above at the, at the moment. Look at the gap back as they fly down Adelaide straight. Scaife takes the inside run. They're weaving all over the shop. They were talking about being conservative earlier. There's nothing conservative about this. It's fantastic to see the two late model cars. The new VT Commodore. Scaife has a run down the inside. He's taken the lead of the sensational Adelaide 500. And Lowndes wants a slice of the action too. He goes very close to the Pertec Ford. Side by side as they head back toward the pit straight. So bright. Now goes back a position. He's got Craig Lowndes torch in third position he wants to be up the lead too will we see jason bright come in soon was he taking it easy it was a nice inside move at the end of the brabham straight into the hairpin by mark scape they come onto the main straight again the pertec ford for the first time this race is in a secondary position and the ford the holden fans i should say on pit straight go crazy as uh, scape goes through to the lead they've got a lot of lap traffic down to pick their way through as if it's not tough enough Round the outside of Simon Emazidis, it gives them racing room. But this is a tremendous leading five cars. Look at this, a run up the inside by Lowndes. Gotcha. So, Jason Bright now coming under fire from Paul Radisic. Oh, Radisic too. Rubbing guards with Lowndes. This is really heating up. He's the wild man, Paul Radisic. Have a look at him go. Really getting stuck into it. Round the back part, Radisic said he's here in Australia to win races. Second will not do. He's had a couple of rough races in Melbourne and Eastern Creek, but look at this, this is on now. Well, they all had a shot at Viagra here, boys. They're all sitting in the queue. They're quite happy to sit there on the, on the lead lap. All of a sudden, it's come alive. Mark Scaife leading the charge, and they've all wanted to go with him. Jason Bright, the leader, for something like 27. Oh, big crash here. Danny Osborne in the colour scan Falcon. That's gone big time. That is right near our lead pack. They have been lucky to escape. Osborne just crunching the front of the colour scan Falcon. That will bring out a yellow that car has been crunched big time goodness me they said this was a tough place lee but that just is evidence of that concrete wall when you get out of shape and you hit that thing here we go oh, here we go this is the flurry of pit stops the two mobile one hrt cars are in radisic missed the pit entry so radisic remains out there is a caution on the circuit but the two mobile one cars are in that was a good call by team chief jeff Gretsch. he saw that crash he saw that they were bringing the yellows out. He got his guys in straight away. So both cars in the pits, Barry. Yeah, I'm down there by Jason Bright. He's not quite far enough forward. There's a bit of a panic going on here because uh, he's not really in the right position to get, uh, get done what has to be done. So the guys are panicking a bit here. I can see there's a bit of flame coming from the uh, left front-hand wheel there. So I don't know... Uh... 
There was, I think they were just a little bit worried because they he wasn't quite on the markers and they weren't looking at the back and weren't sure where they could get the fuel hose in, but it, everything was all right. Well, they're all out. The two Mobile One cars are out. The Pertec Ford is out. That was pretty quick. Now, if they all got on the fuel they wanted, they should have enough fuel to get home. It will just be tyres that are the next stop. I have to mind you at home, if you're watching this, the reason why they weren't changing tyres in that stop is they're not allowed to. It's only a fuel stop and a tyre stop that's allowed. Oh, now that might have been in contact there. And look at the damage on the front of Craig Lowndes' car. Front left light, the front left side of Lowndes' car is damaged. Now, it looks like Lowndes may have clipped there, trying to pick their way through traffic. Might have got a little bit close, and look at the result of that. Danny Osborne, look at this. Lowndes switches, yep. Well, yeah, it is contact. He's clipped the back of the colour scan forward, and look at it ricocheting off the concrete walls at something like 200 kilometres an hour. We hope Danny Osborne's OK, but he took a hell of a hit. That was a big impact. It is very unforgiving here on the streets of Adelaide and a very unfortunate circumstance for Danny Osborne in the colour scan Falcon. Got hit from the rear by Craig Lowndes. Lowndes just pulling out of the draft a split second too late, trying to get around. And there is the end result. Well, it was always on the cards. Very tight racing here. Concrete line canyon. One little mistake and you pay heavily. And Craig Lowndes, they're coming into contact with Danny Osborne. Unfortunately, the privateer doing a substantial damage to his Falcon. You can see the crumpled remains of it there. Of course, an under yellow flag, and I think this is going to be the pattern for this race, Lee. There's going to be a lot of carnage. Yeah. Well, Jeremy, uh, fortunately uh, for Mick Doon and the boys, they don't have to worry about the uh, the concrete wall scenario. No, not, not like the cars, Lee. I mean, uh, the racetracks are very safe these days compared to a few years ago, and uh, uh, we don't have to worry about the this concrete Click. walls. And crunch! Oh, gee, he actually hit where the fence is coming back, so he didn't even hit it, glance off the side. He almost hit it straight on. And full credit to Paul Radisic, who saw that coming and was so quick. He was lightning fast to duck right to the inside of the circuit. Oh. Watch here, watch Radisic's action. Just went across. We lost the shot there. There he goes, right oh. to the outside. He saw that coming, and Radisic picked it beautifully. Well done to the Shell Helix Ford driver, because he avoided an accident big time. Greg? Greg Rust is down in pit lane. Well, down. Well, Tony Longhurst comes into the pits. Greg Rust? Well, it's bedlam down here in the Castro, but I can tell you that, Mark. Tony Longhurst is in a uh, very difficult scenario, trying to get in the tight squeeze between himself and Russell Ingle. Greg Murphy back, back out on the circuit. We've been running for 19 seconds now. Fresh... Uh, now a fresh set of rubber going on Longhurst car, but it was tyres for uh, for Russell, uh, for uh, fuel for Russell rather. And uh, Russell just knocks out of the way one of these spare tyres from Tony Longhurst car. For those of you following at home, and you want to know what your favourite driver has been in doing, fuel is a white tag. They'll rip a white tag off the window and uh, and yellow is for tyres. Well, the tyres are still to come. Not allowed to do it at the one time. Look at how many. Stop then. Faulkner, Longhurst, Ingle. A huge amount. So they're back out. Under caution for the second time today. Well, how big the attrition rate going to be? Radisic has taken over the lead. He has not stopped us yet. Seaton Scape, Johnson, Lowndes, Larkin, Bargwana, Bright. We have a look. Nine back. Tander, Noski, Bow. Crompton working his way up from 37th earlier on after that spin. Ashby sitting in 16th position after being black flagged earlier. Engel after his pit stop is 18th. Faulkner 23rd. More on your home of motorsport right after this. And it was the Pertec Falcon of Jason Bright, which after a great dice with Mark Scaife, actually led them into the first corner here. The Bathurst winner in front, chased by the HRT cars. But there was a spin there as Neil Crompton got involved in a cluster of cars. Wayne Gardner also touched and spun. That was the Denzatron VT Commodore of Thomas Mazira also spinning. Later on, Mazira was one of three drivers to be black flag. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but there's Cromley spinning and being relegated back to the tail of the field. He's since worked his way up into 10th position, but that's after compulsory pit stops. Big clash here. John Briggs and Wayne Gardner came together. Now, Briggs had already been contacted by another car. He spun. He was trying to get back on track. Double yellow flags out to signal a slowdown. Wayne, slow or not, still came round a blind corner and hit Briggs. A lot of anger there. 
Mark Wayne, understandably cranky. That was the second contact he'd suffered. And this is the Garth Tander black flag incident, but that's Trevor Ashby right there, one of three drivers to have to make a stop go. Mazira was the other, and, of course, Tander. There he goes. Garth Tander back in the race and losing a very valuable top four position. Karen Brewer doing very well to keep that car off the wall. Also, early contact for Larry Perkins in that first corner incident we saw, causing some trouble there. And his cooling system needed some work in the pits briefly. Back to the action here where Danny Osborne was clipped by Craig Lowndes as he tried to whip round the slower privateer and that was the result. Disaster for Danny. And unlike Gardner, who has some hope, it's hard to see him getting back in the race at all this weekend. That's why we're under yellow at the moment. And frantic pit stops all over the place. Some drivers, John Faulkner in particular, has been very, very cleverly dipping. Well, he has. Uh, from our point up here in the commentary box, we've noticed that Faulkner has come in on successive laps, done fuel on one lap, gone out and around on an out lap, and has come back in and done his tyres, so Faulkner technically should be able to run for home. We're back under race conditions with Paul Radisic as your race leader. We will confirm that situation with Faulkner. That's just what we're supposing has happened. We're uh, guessing on that one, but that's what we're pretty sure about. We're back under race conditions, which is good. The two wins, Commodore's there, but Paul Radisic leads the way. Field Terrace up through East Terrace, Flinders Street, Hutt Street. This is all second gear material up to 130 kilometres an hour, back down, then up to 130 again before they wind it round onto the back straight. Adelaide, oh, look at that. this Dick is Jim Johnson. Johnson and Craig Lowndes. Yeah, well, a lot of the cars use that yellow flag period to come in. There must be some oil down there. Everyone's running off the road, but it looks like no one spun. So, fortunately, Getting back on the track, but all this field has been mixed up. Paul Radisic is leading because he hasn't come in for a stop yet. It's going to be interesting to watch the Shell team strategy. Didn't take advantage of that yellow flag period. Glenn Seaton up behind him in car five. He hasn't been into the pits either. All right, confirmation from the pits. So our guesses have been confirmed. Faulkner has done tyres and fuel. So John Faulkner, if everything remains OK, he should be able to remain out there until the end. Now, he's a little further down the order. He is outside the top ten at the moment. But we've got plenty of cars out there still to pit, including our race leader, Paul Radisic. Radisic, Seaton, Shell Helix. On board. And you're riding with Paul Radisic with Seaton right behind him. The two AU XR8 Falcons have not pitted yet. And that's the order. Radisic, Seaton, Dick Johnson moves up to third position because car 17 hasn't pitted either there's been a big overlap here and you're watching the two mobile cars trying to find their way through rodney forbes crunch top place privateer the opening round of the shell championship series at eastern creek but not having so much luck today now the word is black flag car one and car one is craig lounge the mobile one holden racing team so drama for hrt Yep, oh, drama upon drama. This race is still pretty young and there's so much stuff happening out there. You can see that radical line the cars are taking as they come out of Hutt Street onto the back straight. There must be some oil or something down there, deliberately avoiding it. Paul Radisic, though, continues to lead from Glen Seat. It's a Ford Trio at the front. Dick Johnson in third. Car one, Craig Lowndes on the charge. Apparently, he has been shown the black flag. We're not sure what that's for. Could have been that incident with Danny Osborne. We will find out. But our reigning champion is really under fire at the moment. Good battle going on further back there. The Pertec Ford being pressed by one of the Holden Young Lions car, or the Holden Young Lions car, which is, of course, Mark Noski. Well, there is the black flag, and that is for Lowndes, and that is for the incident we saw earlier for hitting Danny Osborne in the colour scan Ford and putting Osborne out of the sensational Adelaide 500. Well, the amount of damage on the front of that car, it's no doubt. Yep, yeah, it's always going to happen. These fast guys picking their way through the slower guys. All sorts of drama. And we saw a terrible collision between Craig Lowndes and Danny Osborne. Thankfully, Danny Osborne's OK, Greg.
He certainly is, Mark, but uh, Danny Osborne, the car sustained a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, it hit the wall pretty hard. Um, just got clipped by Lowndes as he was overtaking me. Put in the back of the car and uh, threw it straight into the wall. Were you able to get a good look at just how it happened? Were you looking in the rear view mirror? Or like, how did it all happen? They seemed to be just swamping you. Yeah, yeah, I, he just come up and did a vicious swing and hit the back of the car as he was trying to overtake. I, I moved right over to the left to get out of his way. But I don't know why, why that happened. All right, Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm down here. There's a bit of confusion at the moment because uh, the black flag's out and um, they were going to bring Lowndes in for tyres. But from my knowledge of it, I'm pretty sure when he comes in for a black flag, he can't come in, change his tyres and do the black flag at the same thing because that would just be too nice. And uh, Jeff Gretsch, as I speak, is um, gesticulating and finding out what's going on. But Jeff is not a happy chappy at the moment because he didn't know anything about the black flag until I told until I told him. I, I just heard it. I heard Mark uh, say that he was coming in. Now, he's coming down the pit lane now he won't be coming into his pit um, because he's just going to do his stop for his black flag you see damage on the right front of his car is where uh, he had that coming together when he was overtaking so uh, amazed if I can have a bit of a word with Jeff but I doubt it oh, I don't want to risk it actually hang on a minute you lie there oh uh, well just have a little listen <laughs> Afraid tempers down there, base, but you had it absolutely right. You can't come in and uh, do a little bit of a pit stop as part of a, a black flag stop go penalty. So Lowndes, you can see the crew getting ready, putting new tyres on it. He's got to go around and do another lap, come back into the pits. That's going to cost him even more time. <laughs> I guess Barry Shoes with a pretty angry Jeff Gretsch as Rodney, Rodney Forbes loses again. it again. Down to you, Bass. What's happening, Jeff? Do we know? Uh, no, I don't. We were just told to come in and stop go. Who? another car spun so there might be another okay okay um sorry it's a lot going on um look we had a stop go car one yeah. we, we were told because of the color scan accident yes um we you know craig had said the bloke had got in his way you know we didn't see him but you know you can't argue you can't yeah okay what do you want to do tires yeah, um, well, what, it, what it is at the moment, they were, until I told him about the black flag, they were scheduled uh, Craig to come in for a tyre stop. So what's happening now, they're, they're just sorting out to get, you'll probably see, well, I'm certain you'll see uh, Lowndes come in now and change his tyres. Look at the damage on the right front of the car when he comes in. Have a look around too, Baz, because the first of the Shell Helix Fords is in. Dick Johnson is in for a refuel. Greg? Well, Lee, I can tell you Dick's been in for seven seconds now. As you say, they're taking advantage of the refuel. In behind him, John Bow in the Cat Falcon. They're doing tyres on that car. These guys have been in for around 14, 15 seconds now. DJ Vaughan, 17 seconds that particular stop. All of them taking advantage of this yellow flag. And here comes Craig Lowndes down pit lane. Yeah, boy, watch the overlap here. Holden Racing Team Commodore's in first. Now they're coming in for tyres. Lowndes has already been in for his fuel. They took advantage of that during an earlier incident. Mark Scaife comes in first. Lowndes will hang out there until Scaife's got out of the way. But now in the order, boy, this timing model is tripping up and down and up and down as these positions change, Baz. It's going to be a, no it's going to be a nightmare <laughs> for Jeff Gretsch if he suddenly sees uh, Lowndes appear uh, in the distance there. But it looks as if uh, things go. I'm just looking down the pit lane. I can't see Lowndes right out of the way. I'm going to get one over. Oh, nice one. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's, it's all calm now because uh, they'll wait until Lounsey comes in. Lounsey will come in uh, halfway through this lap or the end of this lap and uh, he should get his new tyres and go off um, and be happy. Well, they wanted a great race for the yeah, sensational of Adelaide 500. <laughs> they have got it. It has been absolute chaos here on the streets of Adelaide, whether it's been with the accidents or the pit stops. Diving in under those caution periods. Here's Rodney Forbes. Now, this is one of two incidents that Rodney has had. Oh. This was number one. Crunch. Bang. Actually, that's a different one to the one we saw yeah. earlier. So yeah. he's actually had three. He's had three incidents. And this is this is limping back to the pits with uh, the damage from that second shunt. He's lost it again. Well, it looks like he's spinning on his own oil there, doesn't it? Yeah, so a lot of damage for Rodney Forbes. Sister car to the PPG car of Trevor Ashby. Well, while we're under caution, we will uh, say thanks very much to Jeremy Burgess, team manager of uh, Mick Doohan. Jeremy, thanks very much for coming up. Sorry we haven't had much of a chance to talk. It's been hectic. That's all right, Lee. Thanks very much for the opportunity. And we wish you all the best, yourself and Mick Doohan, for the entire 1999 series. Thank you very much. Shell Helix replay of Rodney Forbes. Best of three. Three 
Spins, three accidents on the one lap. He's really been in trouble, but apparently they put it behind the wall. Cruising round, still under caution. Stay with us here on your home of Motorsport Network 10. We'll be back. There's plenty more to go. The sensational Adelaide 500. speed, raw anger, and a lot of amazing tactical decisions right here in Adelaide for the sensational Adelaide 500. And one of the men to watch will be in 10th spot, John Faulkner, because he has been very clever, made two of his compulsory pit stops, or both compulsory pit stops, on consecutive laps, and the nine drivers ahead of him, Lee Diffie, have only made one at this stage. Well, yeah, looking at that top ten at the moment, it's Radisson, Clark, Wright, yep. Crompton, Richards, Ingle, Lowndes, Donaher, Dick Johnson, and Lowndes is the only guy who has stopped twice. Everybody else has only stopped once and some haven't even stopped. Radisic and Prompton and Larkham, they haven't even stopped yet. So there's plenty of fat there in the top ten. And, uh, so long as everything goes okay for Faulkner, he'll be rocketing right up there real soon. I was going to say, you look at the overlap there, depending if they're all on the same lap, which they will be because of this pace car period. It's effectively Craig Lowndes in the lead and Faulkner in second, second if you look yeah. at it loosely. So John Faulkner could all of a sudden find himself up in the top three very quickly when these other cars go in for their stops. saying earlier 21 gear changes a lap 1638 gear changes for the race and look at Seaton pumping those arms steering the car you reckon he's not going to be tired or they're all going to be tired at the end of the day well he's just put some fresh rubber on there may be some people home wondering why he's weaving backwards and forwards like that's purely to get some more heat into the tires by weaving backwards and forwards it's distorting the the tread it's distorting the sidewall and getting as much heat into the tires before they go back into racing conditions Glenn, hi, it's Lee Diffie in commentary. Can you hear us? Hi, uh, Lee, how are you? Yeah, good, Glenn. Things going OK so far. Bit of a frantic start, though. Oh, it's been going great. I've just been cruising, and um, we've got all our pit stops over and done with now, so we're just going to go right to the end. Well, Neil's in the pits at the moment. How's strategy? Sorry, you're breaking up there, Lee. I was just saying Neil is in the pits at the moment. Neil Crompton is in the pits. How is team strategy going at the moment? Sorry, Lee, I can't hear you. there and let uh, Glenn get back to work. I can hear you now. Okay, I was just saying that uh, Neil Crompton has just come out of the pits. How is team strategy working out? The team strategy is good, actually. Um, we probably didn't really rely on uh, doing what we just did, but that was the best scenario because we know on tyres we can go all the way to the end now and we know on fuel we can go all the way to the end now. So we're probably in a great position and so is Scafie because Scafie did the same thing, I think. So it's probably going to be a pretty hard ding-dong battle from here. So too did John Faulkner, Glenn. Uh, came in one lap and did fuel, then the next lap and did uh, tyres. Sorry, I can't hear you, Lee. Yeah, well, it's been difficult getting comms with the drivers as they weave their way in and out of these buildings around the tight, twisting streets of Adelaide. There are points where it's clear reception, other times where it breaks up, so you have to bear with us on that. Yeah, well, Seaton just saying he's very, very happy with the team strategy. He can now run to the flag with a few others. A lot of cars coming in for their second stops at the moment too. So once we get back to green flag conditions, we'll know exactly where they sit on the track. Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm with Gary Rogers, and Gary's got a bit of paper in front of him, which is a lap chart, basically, and it's unequivocal proof that uh, Garth Tanner didn't overtake uh, Glenn Seaton, because quite rightly, as you guys up there said, he was actually in front of him. See this bit of paper here. Points <laughs> us out. Show us where it is, Gary. Here clearly it shows Garth was in front of Glenn throughout the race. 34 in front 34 of five. 34 in front of five. At no stage did Glenn overtake him. But the, the alleged infringement was that, that uh, Garth had passed Glenn under a yellow flag. Well, obviously, it's very hard to pass someone when you're already in front of them. I mean, it's unfortunate because Garth's really uh, made a big effort this year so far. We've had a lot of talk. It's the guy's doing a great job, but, you know, we'll press on. He's got one over them now, hasn't he? Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Gary. Great investigative journalism, Barry, as we get back underway. 
as Paul Radisic leads the way, but he and Mark Larkham yet to stop. The Pertec Ford of Bright sitting in third for the meantime. Then we pick up Stephen Richards in the first of the wins, Commodore's fourth. Then we go back to Russell Ingle, back under race conditions here at the sensational Adelaide 500. Radisic leads the way, but how will his strategy pan out and work out? Because he's got two compulsory stops, still the car as Larkham menaces. Well, it's an interesting strategy, isn't it? Because uh, I'll talk to a lot of the teams, they thought about 40 laps here, the tyres would be looking pretty second-hand, so Radisic is out there on his first set of tyres, running a nice light fuel load, but they haven't made any stops, so he's got another two to go. Plenty of speed on board the AU XR8. Two brand new cars lead the Adelaide 500 at the moment. Three new cars, I should say. It's Ford, 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 but it won't stay that way for too much longer. Because these guys are bound to come in. Stephen Richards up there too in the wins Commodore, but he hasn't made a pit stop either, so he's not really in this battle. It's really between these three Fords at the moment. We're on board with the Mitre 10 car. Car 10, Mark Larkham at the wheel. As he tries to close the gap for Paul Radisic. chicane up wakefield street this is the first of this complex of tight 90 degree turns the three fords the reigning bathurst champs sitting third and fourth at the moment but in separate cars on the mountain last year it was jason bright and stephen richards who shared the pertec ford to victory this year stephen richards jumping back to hold it and partnering Greg Murphy in the wins team. Look at Larkham. Sitting in second possession, still behind Paul Radisic. The experienced Kiwi drafted into Dick Johnson Racing Team to replace John Bow after 11 very faithful seasons. The Tasmanian moving on to the new Caterpillar Falcon Ford team from Western Australia. And Radisic really doing his employer, Dick Johnson, proud. Dick in his last season of racing be very pleased with the progress of this Kiwi at the moment. Barry Sheens with Larry Perkins. I'm with Larry. Now, what's happening, Larry? What happened on the first, oh, that corner, I suppose the question is. Well, I think in one uh, short sentence, uh, I blew it. And uh, I arrived there uh, too fast for the circumstances, which was a bit of slow traffic from someone else's problems, and uh, locked up my brakes, and uh, there was nothing Wayne could do about it, and uh, nothing I could do about it after I'd uh, uh, locked up, but uh, I made an error of judgment for sure, and uh, uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne unfortunately paid the price. That's very, that's very honest, Larry. Oh, that's the way it was, <laughs> unfortunately. Any chance of getting back in today? No, the over, I, I damaged my radiator uh, ducting, and um, it overheated the engine and damaged the engine, so uh, we changed the engine, and uh, we, we just got to write uh, today off and uh, try and get it right for tomorrow. You know. Look forward to seeing Larry Perkins and the Castrol Commodore back tomorrow, but uh, good to see him admit his mistake there. Drivers don't often like to do that. And Larry saying, hey, it was my fault. It was right at this very section of the track right now, where he hit the back of Wayne Gardner and turned the Coke Commodore around. And that was just the beginning of Wayne Gardner's problems. Have a look further back through this pack. It's the better electrical Commodore of John Faulkner, who is riding high on confidence at the moment. There he is, right in front of the cat board. Here comes Faulkner. They pulled the car out of the truck after testing it all the last week. Everything was going well. A big improvement on Eastern Creek. This guy had his shining year in 1997 when he was top of the privateers. 98 was a tough slog for him. Here's John Faulkner on the way back in 99. Yeah, Joel has been a tough couple of seasons, but this great new car, built by his small team down there in Melbourne, been very quick straight out of the box. Brand new VT. It's not easy developing a new car, particularly in this level of competition. But John was very determined to do well on the streets of Adelaide, and he pulled the strategy right, going in for pit stops and consecutive laps under a yellow early in the race. Now he finds himself with the rubber and the fuel to go the distance. 
and he could find himself right up there on the podium by the time the first leg of this 156 lap endurance test is over. Well, since Bathurst in 1996, this weekend marked his seventh top ten appearance. The weekend started well, and he's still looking good for the Melbourne-based driver. Here comes Russell Ingall pulling out of the draft as a look up the inside of Stephen Richards. You would think Paul Radisic, our race leader, must be getting close to a field stop. 43 laps completed. And they seem to think that maybe it gets 50 laps, 52 laps out of a fuel load. So obviously it looks like Radisic started with an absolutely full tank of fuel. He'd be praying for a yellow flag period around here soon. Word through Chris Smurden and Cameron McLean have been uh, given a stop-go penalty. because the cars in front need to come in and pit, so look further back because they will be a race leader soon. Up the inside goes Stephen Richards on Jason Bright, so the wind's coming all through. Now here comes Russell Ingall. Whoa, almost a little bit of contact there through these tight 90-degree corners up through Flinders Street. They turn right into Hunt Street and they head down onto the Adelaide straight right now. Look at Ingall menacing on the inside, trying to push through. Now it's going to be a straight line drag. tyre stops as well. We heard earlier in the race that Lowndes had been in for his tyre stop, but apparently he's only been in for a fuel stop, so he's got another stop to go as well. This is looking better and better for John Faulkner all the time. <laughs> yeah, but there it? he is at the back of that pack. John Bowers managed to get past John Faulkner, but Faulkner won't be doing anything desperate. Now we've seen Dick Johnson come in for fuel. He still has to stop for tyres. Sitting there nice. John Bow looking strong on the Caterpillar Ford too, but keep in mind he hasn't made either of his two pit stops. So he's sitting in this train. There he is, the Caterpillar EL Falcon, a new AUXR8 under construction in WA. The team's hoping to debut it when we get over to Barbagallo Raceway in three weeks' time. But look at it. Battered and crunch bodywork on John Bow's car. <laughs> he's got a long way to go too. Plus two fuel stops. One for fuel, one for tyres. Well, in the last two years of the Australian Formula One Grand Prix here on the streets of Adelaide, John Bow completely the curbs 94 and 95 he won all four v8 supercar support races he's got a little bit more work to do some damage to the front left of the car i'm sure john faulkner's crew will be keeping him informed of the situation in front of him just sit in behind there jf and no need to get involved a lot of this cut and thrust a lot of these cars are yet to pit so if he just stays with this lead group he's going to find himself right up the pointy end of the field in a big hurry on well, the west australian base team in front of him john bow and don't forget our western australian round of the shell series round three coming to you from barbagello on sunday the second of may between three and five p.m now for perth people don't forget that there is the first v8 supercar race on saturday afternoon in years gone by as Lowndes makes an inside move on Ingle. Now Ingle comes back. Good racing as they come out of the tight Brabham hairpin. In years gone by, we've shown you that race. Uh, the delayed telecast a week later. We'll be showing you to that uh, showing you that race on the day. Three to five. We'll get that first race done on Saturday afternoon. Back onto the main straight. Mark Larkham doing well, lap 46 of 78. Well, confusion reigns down to the pits. We've had it confirmed that John Bow has, in fact, been in for his two stops for fuel and tyres. So John Bow in with a hell of a shake here. The older EL Ford. They worked very hard. Les Laidlaw, ex-DJR, Steve Renshaw made the move to Perth. They've been working extremely hard. There's the man who's taken his spot in the Dick Johnson Racing Team. Leads the way, Paul Radisic. But we can't emphasise enough. It's a little bit of an illusion because Radisic is yet to stop. So too this car, the minor 10 Ford. Up comes Stephen Richards, the Wings Commodore. They're on the improve. They knew they weren't going to be strong right from the word go as we watch Larkham do a little bit of tap dancing. But now the Wings Commodores start to come good as the year progresses. Oh, up the inside, Stephen Richards has a look down, and he's got him too. 
Car seven looks like the mobile Holden. Racing team Commodore wants a slice to up the inside. So Larkham is he coming? He's getting ready to come in. in. Yep. He's been doing it tough, Mark Larkham. He's been uh, suffering a lot of back pain. They wear the cool suits, which obviously sort of puffs you out a little bit, and it's pushed him forward in the seat. And when he's had to jump on the brakes very hard, he's been experiencing this severe back pain. Greg Rust. Well, Mark Larkham in for a fuel stop, car number 10. Been running for three seconds now. This stop, this uh, team doing a terrific job of things at the moment, and Larko is very eager to get back out on the circuit. I can tell you that, pumping lots of fuel into the AU Falcon. Okay, so next first, he's out of there, 14.3 seconds. Mark Larkham gets back into action after that pit stop. Line of 10 forward, order at the moment, Radisic, Richards, Lowndes, Ingle, Bright, Johnson, Faulkner, Scaife, Bow, Noski, that's the top 10. Longhurst, Murphy, Tanner, Sick, Larkham. It's been no shortage of action. Radisic still leads the way from Richards, Lowndes, Ingle, Bright, Dick Johnson in a great run. And he's say goodbye year. Faulkner and Scape, that's your top eight. We go back through to 16, Bow, Noski, the young guy doing well there. Murphy in 12, Seaton in 14, and Crompton clawing his way back in 16. It's Adelaide, it's alive and it's great. We'll be back with more right after this break. Stay with us. Well, pit lane, that is the key to this race as Paul Radisic makes the first of his two compulsory pit stops this afternoon, and that has dropped him out of the lead position. Stephen Richards still out there, the only driver in that top 10 or even 20 that is yet to make a pit stop. That's an official one. Russell Ingle, Jason Bright, Mark Scaife has been in twice. So has John Faulkner. That's fourth and fifth, and that could be the key to the race. Lee Dippy. And Lowndes has just come in for his second compulsory pit stop as well. So uh, technically, you would say that it is Scaife and Faulkner who really lead the way at the moment because the other guys are yet to come in for the second time. Here's an earlier incident. This is Barry Morecambe and Cruncho. Wow. Big time right into the tyre wall and has pushed right through there. That's the reason for the safety car. Oh, he's OK, but see how much he moved that concrete wall back. Two or three rows of tyres chained together, not enough to save that. Now, there's the front. Scaife. Scaife's car. Bit of damage there. Tyre rubbing. So, drama upon drama unfolding on the streets of Adelaide. And there is John Faulkner's better electrical Commodore. He sits behind this man on screen, Mark Scaife the current Shell Championship Series leader after having a great round at Eastern Creek. Pole position in a new qualifying record. One race one, one race two, and second to his teammate Craig Lowndes in race three. There's Faulkner. Was the first to set the pattern of coming in under a safety car, changing tyres on one lap and fuel the other. Well, he did it in the other... Uh, the reverse order, fuel first, then he did tyres. Successive laps. As Morecambe car, Morecambe's car gets cleaned up. We're on lap 50 of 78. Well, confusion reigns down in the pits at the moment with all this rash of pit stops. Information we're getting, a few conflicting signals. We do apologise for that. We'll sort it out before this race is over. Just unbelievably frantic pit activity. The way we understand it, Stephen Richards is leading, Ingle second. As you can see on the bottom of the screen there, the leaderboard. But these positions in a constant state of flux. They're constantly changing depending on how many stops the guys have made, which stops they've made. Now on the last lap, Dick Johnson was in seventh position. He is now in pit lane. This is his second compulsory stop. We saw him come in earlier for fuel. This is his tyre stop. Having a great run is Dick Johnson, the winner of the very first V8 supercar. Or rather, back then, it was the Australian Touring Car Support Race, 1985. And he won that in a Ford Mustang. Now problems here for Scaife. Bit of damage bodywork there. Felix climbing underneath. There could be some damage to the front suspension as well. 
Jeff Gretsch, the guy standing at the front of the car. Mark Scaife changes drink straws. He's got two drink bottles behind him there. Just as an example of the dehydration that's taking place in these cars. Very hard physical activity driving them, and there's enormous cockpit temperatures. It really does sap a lot of fluid out of the drivers out of sheer perspiration. You can see there's a couple of tools, slide hammers there, trying to pull that guard up. Get it away from that tyre, get him back onto the queue before the race goes back to green. There he goes, Mark Scape is gone. So, good work. Plenty of cheers too coming from this big crowd on the main straight here in Adelaide. The grandstand is absolutely chockers. And they love their Mobile One Holden Racing team. Scape re-enters the circuit to give it his best shot. It's a replay earlier of uh, Craig Lowndes had taken Stephen Richards. This is at the end of the Adelaide straight, going through the tight right-hander onto the now shortened Brabham straight. There's Paul Radisich, the then race leader. Look at Steve and Richards. Stevie Richards just tucking up the inside. I think he caught Craig by surprise. Yeah, he really did. And then Russell Ingle, he wanted a slice. He goes around the outside of the mobile car, wasn't quite alongside. So, boy, the Adelaide fans wanted a sensational 500. They're certainly getting it. This is only the first leg. 250 kilometres will complete the distance tomorrow. Another 78 laps to come. <laughs> I'm not sure if we can bear it. Well, you heard us say earlier when he was in 10th position, gee, this looks good for John Faulkner. The better electrical Commodore is now in second position. He has played it smart. A good team strategy. Great shot there from the Whitman's light ship. Look at the crowd along the front straight. It is Grand Prix days all over again here in Adelaide, lap 52 of 78. Now we're getting close to the end of this one, but just remember this is leg one of two. It is one complete race split over two days. Greg Rust. Well, the uh, car 18, Paul Radisich, who was leading before, as you mentioned, now comes into the pits. He's uh, done his stop for fuel, but this will be the one for the tyres. So the Shell team very quickly swap on the car they've got the front tires off already 11 seconds gone for paul radisic what a performance he's been putting in here today and this car is really starting to come on strong isn't it particularly after that first round at eastern creek uh, a round that i think he'd prefer pretty much to forget but he's uh, eager for points at the moment 25 seconds gone the team raise their hands in the air take the other uh, strip off and radisic is out of in lane <laughs> I tell you what, he's a cool customer. When the camera first looked at him, you could just see him wink at the camera. Yeah, she's all right, mate. She's under control. No worries. He's having a good day. Paul Radisich, the Kiwi, very, very happy. And the Queensland-based Shell, Dick Johnson Racing Team. And he really has knocked this new AUXR8 into shape very quickly. And the car has been ultra-competitive all day. He was leading this race pretty handsomely a few laps back. Joins the queue behind the safety car under full caution, yellow flag period. As the laps wind down, 52 completed of 78. Who will lead to the end of this first leg? Well, the 36-year-old who now resides on the Gold Coast, the Kiwi, he's only on a one-year contract with Dick Johnson Racing. Reckon he might extend it? Well, <laughs> I think Dick would like to extend it, that's for sure. The way he's going at the moment. He said he's here for one thing, he's here to win, not interested in second. And he's here to take the Shell Helix Ford team, Dick Johnson Racing, back up to where they belong. We all know it's Dick's farewell year, as he calls it quits. And he'll enjoy just racing. But Radisic is not here to race, he's here to win. And he's done a very good job so far in leg one of the sensational Adelaide 500. Fantastic view from the Whitman's lightship. Looking down to Ketterville Terrace, through the hairpin there, so swing back toward the race course. Magnificent facility here in Adelaide, and it really has captured the imagination of the locals. They've come out in record numbers, they're really loving their V8 action here this afternoon. Barry. Just, uh, just wondering, I was talking to the starter and asked the starter if he's going to finish this race with a chequered flag, and he said, yes, I am. But as far as I was concerned, this race is um, not going to finish today. It's going to finish tomorrow afternoon, so it's just going to be continued tomorrow. Do you understand what I mean? So basically, they're finishing the race. In the sporting code, it says the finish of the race will be deemed by the showing of the chequered flag. Well, if they show the chequered flag today, surely that means the race finishes today. Well, I was under the impression that it was going to be... Uh the race was going 
to be completed under a full course yellow. Well, as you see, well, the starter, and it's the bloke with the flags, I asked him <laughs> just now and said, well, no, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to finish it with a chequered flag. Well, listen, you're our, uh, you're our groundhog, you're our investigative <laughs> journalist, as you showed before. No, but he said, <laughs> he said, why, what have you heard then? I should have said, oh, it's a black flag, didn't anybody tell you? No, I don't know. So I'll keep you updated. But it's going to be interesting because the sporting code does say the finish, the finish of the race is with a checker flag. Go get them, Baz. Stay tuned. Yeah. There you go. Just a portion of this huge crowd that's here at Adelaide. And they're not just from South Australia. They've come from all over Australia to enjoy the V8 supercars here at the Adelaide 500. We'll be back with more right after this break.